Welcome to the Destiny Church Tees Valley podcast. As you listen, it is our prayer that you are transformed by audacious faith, inspiring hope, and extravagant love. Well, we're going to continue in our series of Fight for Truth. But before I let you know what the title is today, why don't you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. It's the first book of your New Testament, if you've got one. Chapter 4, just the first few verses, it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord to the test. Today I want to unravel some ideas about it is written, versus it is also written. Have you ever been in a situation in a context where maybe you've heard some scripture, some maybe word of God that's been spoken and you think, I'm not sure that's quite the right application of that word. Or I'm not quite sure that was maybe the context to quote that piece of scripture. Great understanding, but maybe the wrong environment for it. Here you see when Jesus was in an environment with the enemy, in the devil in temptation, The devil did not come to Jesus with lies. He did not say, you are not the son of God. He claims you are the son of God. Even the devil, even the enemy knows who Jesus is. So he does not decide to go for something that he knows Jesus knows, but decides to maybe go to stuff that he says is the truth, which is the word of God. The irony is, is that Jesus does not just know the word of God. We know in John chapter one that Jesus is the word of God. And so he knows how to apply the scripture in context and when it is used outside of its original intention. So when the devil decides to misuse scripture, Jesus decides to say, it is also written. Today, I want to unravel some ideas that maybe we... We know so much about God. We know so much about Christianity that the devil couldn't really tell you you are not a child of God. But maybe he could bring some twisted ideas into our understanding that actually means that we're misunderstanding other purposes in our life. Maybe we're misunderstanding the application of the word of God. And instead, as a child of God, we need to be able to say it is also written. The beauty here, and I won't go into it too much, but the beauty here is that when Jesus quotes it is also written, he's actually saying to the devil, This is what your scripture means in context. This is actually what you're trying to tell me about Deuteronomy. And if you're interested to hear a little bit more about unpacking that, well, earlier this year we had uh, Dr. John Andrews do a great uh, teaching day with us about winning in the wilderness. And um, the tech team have just uploaded that onto Spotify and to iTunes. So you can listen to that and get downloaded of all that great content content, that great teaching material about what really is going on there in that full conversation. But I don't want to get drawn into all the details of just this one conversation. I want us to look about the idea of, do we have some twisted truths in our understanding? Are there maybe some scriptures that we use, but we misuse them? Maybe we don't fully understand the context that they're in. And when we use them in conversations, when we use them implied in our life, it's twisted. Have you ever been in a situation, a conversation where you've been misquoted or misinterpreted? You know how frustrating it is because maybe the words were right, but it's said and applied in the wrong context. Or maybe actually the words you said, you realize that they understood that language in a completely different way. And we understand how even in the English language, it can be so intricate. Never mind thinking about when the Bible was written, it was, back, it was written in three different languages. And so we've had some fantastic people that have gone before us that have some of them literally died to write the Bible in our tongue, in our language, which is incredible. And we're so, so thankful for it. However, sometimes you can miss things in translation. I know last year I was 
um, in the opportunity of doing some extra teaching work with some schools. And I somehow, I don't know how, but I ended up teaching two year eight classes French. Now, give you a bit of background. I know no French. I mean, I did a little bit of German at school, but German and French have nothing in common. And I walked into this class not knowing what I was supposed to do. So I understand when you feel like something is so foreign, I'm so grateful that the, the Bible is written in our own tongue. But what I was also aware of is, even just in the simple exercises of, can we translate this paragraph? And I was just totally winging it with the year eights. They had no clue. I was like, yeah, let's Google it. Um, and so we were, we were going through it. Uh, praise God also for Google Translate. And we were translating the words, but we know how things can sometimes have a different understanding and a different ideas. And so we're going to look a little bit at how to apply truth of scripture. So if you want to write a title for this morning survey, um, sermon, I've called it Twisted Truths. And we're going to look at um, a couple of tips I've got. These are not all the tips, but a couple of tips for us how to apply scripture, how to handle, how to grasp scripture, and how to use the Bible in its correct form. So tip number one, if you're taking notes, you can say, very simply, to pick it up. Or maybe you're on the technology and you want to swipe it open. It would be very easy for me to launch in straight away and say, this is what you do with the word of God. But there's no point me starting there if you don't have the word of God in your hands. If you don't already read it, if you don't already know what the content says, then there's no point me telling you how to use the content in life. The Bible is more accessible today than probably the people who wrote it would have ever dreamt of. They would have absolutely loved to realize how accessible in multiple languages, in multiple versions of our own language, that we have the Bible. We have the Bible in a nice little format like this. If you don't have a hard copy of the Bible, there are plenty of apps on your phone that are free and they give you access to the full content of the Word of God. So why is it maybe sometimes that we don't just pick up the Bible? Well, I wonder, is it because we've got so many distractions? Do you maybe need to shut the door on some distractions? Do we need to maybe set some reminders, just some helpful prompts in our daily routines? Maybe you're just creating a new habit, a new pattern in your life. Ideally daily, but if you're not reading the Bible at all, then just start, even if it's small, even if it's just a couple of sentences a day. There's uh, a great app called YouVersion, and it is free, and on there they have plans as well. Multiple and multiple of plans, so if you said, hey, actually, I want to learn a little bit more about God's promises for my life, well, you could look at God's promises. If you want to learn a bit more about what the hope is of the world, then why don't you put in the hope? Or if you want to learn a bit more about what your purpose is in life, then put in purpose. And they give you all these plans. If you want to read a book, then why don't you start off with the book of Matthew that we've just been reading together now. You can start reading the word of God straight away. There was a quote, and I'm not quite sure where I heard it from originally, um, but I absolutely love it. And it says this, if the Bible is dusty, then your life is rusty. And I think for many of us, we kind of think there are some kind of cracks in our life, some kind of squeaky things going on. But we just need to pick up the word of God and be like, this is what's going to feed me. This is what's going to make me a well-oiled machine again. The Bible also is a great faith builder. When you hear the word of God, there's something that just happens in your spirit and it builds up so much faith. But I don't want you just to hear it from me. I think sometimes we can so easily be in a, in a world where there is so much content about the scripture. You could go onto YouTube and you can hear some great conversations there about the word of God. You could turn on the TV and hear TBN or the Hillsong channel. You can come on a Sunday morning or you could go to your connect group and people are constantly talking in these environments about the word of God. But why settle for it second hand? Why don't you get the, uncover the truth for yourself? Why don't you get into your own space in your own devotional pattern and go, wow, this is what God is saying to us. This is what he's declaring about us as a people group. And you can uncover the truth. Don't just say it because that's what the pastor said on Sunday, but that's because I know it is written. And we cannot be able to quote it if we've never first started to read it. And so I'd encourage you, if you've never read it, 
Try it. Just give it a go this week. Start small. Maybe even just starting by getting a Bible, maybe downloading the app or finding access to one. And I'd also encourage you that if you've maybe slipped in dis- into distractions and you've slipped out of a good rhythm and a pattern and a habit of reading the Bible, can I just encourage you, just start again. There is no kind of ritual of, oh, you've got to do this and that and then you can start reading your Bible again. If you've wandered away from reading your Bible, just pick it up. That is the tip that I'd give you. Just pick it up. So whatever you do, just read the Bible. Tip number two, motivation matters. What I mean by this is the Bible is not just to be a book that is studied, but it is a book to be lived. It is the living word of God. It is not like a textbook that just gives us information. But if we accept the revelation in our life, it will transform yours and I world. It will transform this nation. And we can see how it transforms our mind personally, but also just the whole environment that we engage with. There are so many ways to read the Bible for myself. I've read it to look at theology when I was at school. I've read it to look at maybe the history. I know some of my friends who have read it just because it's known as a great literature book. There are many, many ways you can read the Bible, but not all of them are helpful. And what I want you to be encouraged today is not just to read the Bible, to read into it as what you want to see, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but actually to let the Bible speak to you first. And this is why the motivation matters is, why are you picking up the book? Are you picking up the Bible to engage with it because you want to find something that proves your point? Are you picking up the book because it just looks like a good story? Are you picking up the book because you believe it can transform your life and God will speak to you through it? So are you teachable in those moments when you open up the Bible? Are you humble enough to accept the promptings of what God is maybe trying to work in you and through you in those moments? Are you hungry enough to read more than just two minutes? And you can just engage further and further into the scripture. So motivation matters as well as when we um, engage with the Bible. And the third thing before I launch into a bit more is we need to invite the Holy Spirit and pray. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 16, it says this. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deepest, of, um, deepest things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows what the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities within spiritual taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerning only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to reveal stuff to us in the Spirit. We need to allow him to open up our eyes. There's a great prayer in Psalm 119 that says, Open the eyes of my heart, God. Pray as you're opening the Bible and say, Spirit, will you open my eyes as I read these? That it's not just mere words on a text. Maybe you've done Bible readings before and you just thought, oh, I'm a bit bored or I'm not really sure I'm getting anything out of it. Why don't you pray with the Spirit to say, will you open my eyes to see what you are trying to tell me today? The Bible, what is beautiful about it, can be understood at just about every level. It can be understood at the level of where you're, we call you born again. You've accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You are following him and you are living for him. And the Bible speaks to you in those moments. But what's also amazing is the Bible can speak to you even if you've had no Christian understanding, even when you've had no Christian education. If you just open it up and say, God, will you just speak to me through this? It's one of those books where the most intelligent people spend their lifetime trying to understand all of its content and never do. But it's also a book that every person like you and I is able to engage with on a level and still be able to see the truth applied into our life. So I'd encourage you, 
when you open up your Bible, when you're engaging with the Word of God, pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you in that process. And tip number four is to mind the gap. Have you ever been at a train station and you've heard the train come along and they go, ding, ding, mind the gap, please. And they have this whole, um, like, I guess, uh, warning because they're aware that you could stumble or fall because of the little gap between the platform and the station. In this context, mind the gap is the gap is everything between the original writer who wrote the, the words you are reading and us today. For the word of God has always meant what it meant and it has never changed its meaning or understanding. But sometimes the words that we're reading we have changed in our time and our understanding. There are two uh, words that I'm uh, just going to use briefly, and one is exegesis. Exegesis is a, um, a word that's used when people are trying to study the word of God, and it's all about drawing the truth out of a text. So we see this as the correct application of scripture, of you let the scripture speak and you draw the truth out of it. There is another word called um, eisegesis, which is reading into the text what you want to see. So those two different paradigm shifts are very, very different because one is I've come with my own motivation, I've come with my own understanding, my own thoughts and opinions, and I'm going to read that into the text and say that's what the author is saying to me right now. But the other understanding is letting the words speak to me. So we often need to understand a bit of the context around the words that are written. You see, when we read the Bible, it, when we read Matthew just there at the beginning of this sermon, Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. He followed Jesus. He knew Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus perform miracles and lived alongside him. But we've also got to realize that that was 2,000 years ago. And when um, Matthew was writing these words, Matthew was writing them to the people of that time. So often when we read the parables, we see how Jesus is using a lot of agriculture ideas and things. And for us, who most of us are not in an agriculture career, some of those ideas get missed along the way. We don't always understand the whole meaning behind the parables or behind the teachings. And that's why it's really helpful for us to understand some of the larger context and the larger understandings around the Bible. But what's great is we don't have to do all the hard work ourselves, but actually so many people have done it for us. Number one, the author themselves. I would say about 75% of the content, context that you want to know about the scripture you're reading, the author has told you in the beginning. Maybe at the beginning of the parable, it will tell you what the meaning of the parable is, and at the end, it might even tell you again. So often the, the writers are very helpful in their language. But if there are some things that maybe you're thinking, I'm not quite sure whereabouts in maybe the time of history this is about, or I'm not quite sure who the writer was writing to, or this kind of context, then there are some great commentaries and Bible study books that can help you understand the picture of where this scripture is written. But you see, what happens is um, we have a tendency to use just snapshots of the Bible. What I mean by this is we have uh, verses and we have chapters of the Bible, which we must admit is probably very, very helpful for us. Even at the beginning when I mentioned, let's turn to Matthew 4, you all were able to locate the reference very easily. If we did not have that, this reference system, it would be a bit harder for us to navigate through the Bible. However, sometimes this navigating system, which was made to help us reference things in the Bible, can actually limit it, our understanding. What I mean by this is we then end up taking a snapshot of one verse and thinking that is the entire message itself, and we've taken it out of context of the whole paragraph, or we've taken it out of context of that whole book. And we've got to understand the author is writing a story. And like any maybe film we watch, any book we read, if we ended up taking just a little snapshot that someone says, we can so easily twist it. We can so easily misuse it and mishandle it. And so it's really important for us to understand that this reference system is here to help us as a reference system. And it wasn't intended to be like, this is the next idea, this is the next um, point. And to understand that's the context of the reference system. So we, must, we just need to be careful of the way that we apply just individual scriptures in that way. And so what I thought is I will do a demonstration of one, probably one of the most popular common um, scriptures that 
In fact, a U version showed that it was the most highlighted scripture last year in the Bible. And no, it is not John 3.16. I know many of you are thinking that's the most popular uh, Bible verse. It is not. It has been overtaken by another one called Jeremiah 29.11. And Jeremiah 29.11 is a, a verse that is often quoted. It is a verse that is often made cushions and pillows out of. We have the verse on our social medias. We can have the verse hung up in our um, rooms and stuff, which is great. You know, using scripture in um, these different formats is great, as long as it means what it says, and we're not using it out of context. So what I want to do is reframe this idea of what Jeremiah was talking about in verse 11. But I'm going to encourage you, you'll love it even more, okay? So you don't need to throw out those cushions just yet. You'll love this verse even more. So in this verse of um, Jeremiah 29, 11, before we read it, in case you don't already know what it says, I'm not going to let you have the twisted truth already. Don't worry, we'll untangle this for you right here, right now. So Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament, and he was sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles to the priest and the prophets um, and the people of Nebuchadnezzar. And they were all carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this is the context. So Jeremiah is speaking to a people in exile, the Jews in exile. And the prophet Jeremiah um, is saying and obviously showing that the Jewish people have very blatantly rebelled against um, God. He's saying they have massively and blatantly rebelled against God. They've neglected, ignored, and disobeyed, and turned to other gods. And because of their obedience, in response to their disobedience, they have been under a rule of the Babylonians for 70 years. So when Jeremiah says this, imagine if I have just come to you and you're all under exile under another nation and I go, well, it's because you're rebellious and because you're disobedient that God is going to put you under this captivity for 70 years. I can imagine your reaction and your response would be, we're not accepting that news today. No, thank you. But then there was this other prophet that came along, and this was called Hananiah. And Hananiah came along and went, no, 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 that's not right, that's not right. The message that God is saying is, he will give you victory, and God is going to prosper you and give you a year of breakthrough. But then what happened is Hananiah in the next two years died. And it didn't come to pass. And in fact, Jeremiah's prophecy was true. There is a difference between the good news and a false good news. And we need to make sure as the people of God, we are chasing and we are living in the good news, not a false good news. So what the exiles understandably wanted to hear was it will all be over soon. But instead, in Jeremiah 29, verses 10, so the verse just before our favorite quoted verse, this is what Jesus, uh, God says, sorry. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So Jeremiah here is speaking to the elders. He's speaking to people that will not actually see this come to pass. He's saying this is what's going to happen. So prepare your people. What we need to understand here is that if we're using a piece of scripture, so like Jeremiah 29, 11, which um, we'll uh, mention in a minute, we've got to understand that we need to not make Christianity sound like it is easy. You see here, what God is saying is, you're going to have some hardship. You're going to go through some troubles and you're gonna, it's going to be a nightmare for 70 years. But then he comes with a message of hope and saying, I I have plans to help you and to hope, uh, hope for your future. But it's hinged on this whole idea that you're actually going to go through some turbulence. You're actually going to go through some real testing trials. You're going to go through exile for 70 years. And what we need to understand is we can't make Christianity sound like it is comfortable and a, prof, um, a prosperity of a life. If you hear the scriptures used always in that way, then what does it mean for Christians who do not live in the Western world? 
You see, we can easily in this engaging conversation in Norton say, yeah, do you know, God wants to give you loads of money, but actually, what are we going to say to the Syrian mother who has four kids and is a Christian in a refugee camp, and one child is dying of disease? What do, what do we say there? You see, the Bible is true and timeless in every situation, and we can't say one thing in one environment and then go and say something else to another lady in another environment. We can't just say that God only wants Christians in the Western world to have the good car parking spots. We can't say that he only wants us in the Western world to have the great Christmas gifts and our favorite sports team to win the year. We can't use the scriptures out of context and then expect to be able to use it in another context in a different way. Craig Rochelle says this, what I can't preach everywhere, I shouldn't preach anywhere. And it is so powerful and so true. And if you find yourself ever saying something that you think, actually, could I say that to the persecuted church? Could I say that to the people who are literally martyred for their faith? Because that doesn't sound like what I'm talking about with the prosperity gospel. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, um, plans to uh, prosper you and to give you a... Um, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And God has hinged that on the back of where he says, you're going to go through issues. But don't worry, because I use all things together for good. Don't worry, because I have a bigger plan. I am a sovereign God, and I see the big picture, and I'm not in the same timeline as you. But you're going to suffer. A whole generation is going to suffer. Maybe even a bit more than a generation is going to go through turmoil. And so I can't deny that truth, but it is also true that it, you will um, have a hope and a future. Maybe a better verse for us to use in moments where we're trying to, I think often we use this verse in a time where we try to show hope and that God's got a purpose for our life. Maybe a better um, verse for us to use would be Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work together. You see, God is a God who's working constantly behind the scenes, even when we cannot see it, even when we don't believe it. He is orchestrating things and he is moving things around. And even if we don't understand why one Christian at the other side of the world is having to die for their faith, and we've got Christians here that can't even just pick up the Bible. We have Christians in North Korea that are hiding so many thousands of Bibles because if they are found with them, they will be martyred for their faith. And maybe even worse, all their family as well. So we, we can't dis connect the understanding of truth worldwide because it is the truth and Jesus is the truth but also I want to encourage that if someone does end up quoting this and they're like Jeremiah 29 11 don't feel like you've got to get your notes up and go heretic <laughs> like you don't need to kind of like well actually this is the context because there is a truth that God is good and there is the truth that God has a hope for his nation. But what I want us to understand is that we can't um, divorce these ideas, we can't separate these ideas that actually it was the exile that there's a hope for. And unless you're going through an exile, I can't say there's a hope there, unless you were the Jewish people in the exile. And that's the conversation that we're having. But there are many, many words that are so encouraging. So let's continue from Jeremiah 29, 11. So remember, we've just had Jeremiah 10, where God is just saying, you will go through a lot of issues. You're going to have 70 years of exile. But don't worry, I've got a plan. That's verse 11. And then he continues with this in verse 12. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found in you, declares the Lord. Now that is a verse worth memory. That is the verse that is worth actually being the most highlighted verse of the year. That is the verse where we should make plaques out of, we should make cushions out of. That he's a God who listens. He's a God that hears you. And that when you seek him, you will find him. He is a God that loves you. And it is those verses that actually are so true, whatever context you're in. So even if you're in the persecuted church, it is still that if you seek him, you can find him. It is still that if you cry out to him, he will listen and he will help you. And we've got to understand that the real message of the gospel isn't that life is easy, but that God is a good God. And he'll always reveal himself to us. He will never leave us alone. So this can be our verse. This can be our verse, that we called on him and he answered. That is, the, that is what Jeremiah is talking about here is you were a people group that ignored God. You were a people group that rebelled against God. 
you were dis proactively disobedient. It wasn't that they didn't understand who God was. They knew who God was. And they proactively disengaged with what God told them to do in their worship and in their lifestyle. And because of that, because of the result, then it meant that they were in this exile. But he's saying, hey, I can work all things together for good. And so because they then called on him, he then answered. So perhaps maybe Jeremiah 29 verse 12 to 14 should become our favorite rather than Jeremiah 29, 11. So hopefully that's encouraged you to maybe grapple a little bit more with scriptures and understand that there is the full context. And let's not just take snapshots and let's not be quick to judge and read into a text what we want it to say, but let the text speak to us and let's always mind the gap because there was an original author who had an original message and intention. Another example, have you ever sent a text message or an email and you got a response back and you were shocked? And it was very clear that the person who received the email misunderstood your message. Either there was a word of a language that maybe was twisted in their understanding, or maybe it was just the tone of it that they thought was maybe sharp or weak. But who actually made the message? It was the person who sent it. So who authored the message, the person who sent it. Now, the person who received it might have misunderstood it and it was twisted, but that wasn't the original intention. And we've got to understand this with scripture is sometimes in the church history, sadly, words and scriptures have been used and twisted out of um, understanding. It does not mean that it is not the word truth and it does not mean that God is not a good God. But what we've got to understand is let's just put that verse back into the context and let's just read it in that whole paragraph. Why don't actually, let, if you're still needing understanding, read it in that whole chapter. Still a bit more, read it in that whole book. If you're still a bit more, read the whole Bible because the Bible is one big story of God's love to God's people. And so what another helpful way of doing it is analyze scripture with other scripture, not just with your own experiences of what scripture should be. So there's just some helpful tips for you to mind the gap. Tip number five then is to learn in community. The Bible was not um, created for us just to read in our own uh, daily devotions. Now, I'd encourage you and I'd urge you to read it for yourself and to have that um, quiet time with God. But actually, the Bible was written to be read to a group of people. When the um, writers were writing it, they understood that most people weren't, um, didn't have the reading ability. They weren't um, educated. And so when they were writing the scriptures, they wrote it for plural. They wrote it for a people's group. And it also helps us to not fall in the trap that Jeremiah 29, 11 does, where it's like, God has a promise for me. God has a promise for me, but actually he's talking to you. He's talking to us. He's talking to a group and saying, God has a purpose for us. He has a promise for us. And it helps you to not become so self-centered in your Bible reading, but understand that actually maybe what's our function as a whole group together in mission? Some great practical points is plug into a connect group. You know, you're reading the Bible there together. You can discuss and apply the message to your life. Church here, amazing, you know, on a s Sunday morning where we can explain the, um, the stories of the Bible to you. Or we have the maturity course as well. We have some uh, courses to help you grasp hold of the Bible. And it'll help you to understand how to engage further in some of these texts. For us to realize that the Bible is for us. We often have to learn in community. Tip number six is study, or in other words, you can ask questions that are towards applying the truth. So here's some questions I've written down that maybe you could help trigger your reading time in the Bible. How does this truth revealed here affect my relationship with God? How does this truth affect my relationship with others? How does this truth affect me? How does this truth affect my response to the enemy? Just some triggered ideas. There could be plenty more that you head on with. But ideas that are always pushing you towards application. Because we don't want to get stuck in a rut of we're just in this little like study room. And we're just reading the Bible. And we can have all this content and this information and knowledge. But then it's not actually outlived and outworked into our life. Once you understand what the word of God teaches you, then we are obligated. We are obligated before God to accept the truth and live by it. And there are two words here that I want to unpack. When we have received what the understanding of the scriptures say, 
and how we can maybe um, help us in this application process. So one is reproof. It basically exposes areas in your thinking and behavior to what is not aligned with God's word. Have you ever just read a piece of scripture and you feel like you're just being thumped in the stomach? You feel like the wind has just been taken out of and you're like, oh my days, that is me. I'm a sinner. Newsflash, we all are. But anyway, <laughs> but you kind of take this kind of out in you and you're like, wow, I'm really sorry, God, for doing this. Or actually, I never realized this meant this. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, I never realized this. You know what? I'm, I'm going to be diligent in, in my understanding of the word. I'm going to be diligent because you know what? I'm taking the word into context that many people will never read the Bible. So I need to make sure I'm using it appropriately. And so in this um, behavior, we realize that we're just not aligned with what, uh, what God was originally intending for us. So we acknowledge that we are wrong in our thought and our behavior. The second one is correction. And this is the step in the application that is most difficult, I would say, for us. Um, many times it is one thing to confess, but it's another thing for us to forsake what is doing wrong. And so, you know, here I would say engage with the Holy Spirit and just pray for him to help you. Most of the time, you do just need to confess and say, I'm sorry for, you know, living differently to what you expected me to live God I didn't know but now I do and now I'm going to obey your word it might be that you've twisted some truths in your life and you go actually I'm really sorry God that I didn't do a diligent study and I was just being spoon fed second hand by so many people but now I'm going to you know take this truth first hand with you and I'm going to grapple to understand these texts and and this is my correction or maybe God in whatever your situation is will give you some defined steps to take but I'd encourage you to have that conversation with him and to follow through in the application. And tip number seven, your last tip for the day. I'm sure in your connect groups you can come up with so many more tips that I've come up with. But here's my last tip for you today is to meditate and memorize. So meditate, this is what meditate means. I'm aware it's a word that gets used quite flippantly in today's culture. It means to just think about it, just to ponder and to think about it. I find in conversations with um, people in just generally in life, you know, you're talking to them and you realize that life is just so heavy on their shoulders and just feeling so overwhelmed by what is going on. But what's amazing to me is then when you follow up with a conversation of when was the last time you read your Bible? Oh, right. Well, that was not what I was expecting. I was expecting you just to kind of lift me up and send me on my way. No, when was the last time that you grappled with God in in, in in what he's saying to you and sometimes I think well what's that got to do with this situation in my relationship or what's that got to do with my finances but it has everything to do with it because you've forgotten how much God loves you and if you read the Bible and if you meditate and think about it God loves you so much he does not expect you to be the savior of your world but he gave you a savior and no longer do you have to act like everything is the onus on you but actually you can cast your cares and your burdens onto him and so when you meditate on the word of God and you realize that actually I have a savior and his name is Jesus Christ and I can live in that truth that then actually you're you're set free you're liberated in what you do because you no longer walk into that work environment in the office and feel like it is up to you to save that environment to save people's jobs but actually realize you'll put in your hard work and let God do the rest that you'll actually realize that you're following the king of kings and he will help you in everything that you do so you're struggling with parenting and raising your children well don't worry it's not all down to you you have the Holy Spirit who's wanting to champion you and help you. You've got the word of God there that's reminding you that he's already done it so many times before for other people. And he can do it again for you. So meditating it and thinking about it on a regular basis is so key so that we don't forget it. And that memorizing it because the Bible is our sword. What I love about the conversation Jesus has with the devil is that when the devil goes, it is written... Jesus doesn't then go, oh, I remember we did this in school one time. Oh, someone preached about this. Where are my notes? Oh, let me just go on. One second. One second, devil. Um, oh, um, was it Deut Deuteronomy that he was just quoting there? Oh, yeah, I think it was. Oh, but that was out of context. Let me just read the context. Hmm. Oh, I think you misquoted that and twisted the truth there, devil. I think instead, no, no, Jesus just goes, it is written. Now, we know that Jesus has an advantage because he is the word of God. But we need to understand that when we are tempted, we rarely have the Bible on us. When we are in those moments where we are in tests and trials and exile and where we feel so much of the weight of the world on us, where we feel we are being attacked, you rarely have the Bible on you. 
but we have to be able to quote the truth to the opposing, to be able to say it is written, but it is also written, and saying it in truth and proclaiming what God really said to us. And I, the other reason why I think um, memorizing the word of God is so key, because I find the majority of the battles I faced in my life, and I'm sure probably for the majority of us in this room, the battles have been in our mind. And if we can quote the scripture to ourselves, because we're not always facing the devil. Let's not kid ourselves. We're often just facing our own flesh. We're facing ourselves. If we can quote the scripture to ourselves and keep aligning ourselves with the truth, we will not get twisted to the left or to the right. But we will stay on the path and we'll go encourage ourselves with what is right and what is true. So when you are tempted, what do you say? Do you say, wait a moment, I'm going to just call the pastor and see what they have to say. Wait a moment, I'm just going to call my connect group and, you know, we're just going to uh, try and you know, do a bit of a Bible study on this because I'm not quite sure this is right. Are you already prepared in and out of season for when those times of turbulence come that you can say it is also written? I know that many of us will be in so many different stages of our journey with the Bible. And that is fine. It is a journey. And it is one that will take a lifetime. But what I want to encourage you is, is there one of these steps that you can apply today? Maybe the first one, pick it up, was enough for you just to take today. All you need to do is just pick up the Bible. Maybe for you need to realize and reflect on your heart about what is the motivation when I pick up the Bible? Am I just reading it to tick off a checklist or am I reading it so it can speak into my life? Do you invite the Holy Spirit? Do you pray in your Bible reading time? Do you mind the gap? Do you remember the gap between the writers and us? Are you learning in community? Are you isolated when you study? Are you asking questions so that you can provoke towards an application rather than staying in just an idea of information world? Are you meditating and memorizing the word of God so that when you are faced with twisted truths, you're able to say, it is also written. Whatever tip helps you today, I hope that you're able to take one of them away because the word of God is a sword when it is applied right. We don't want blunt swords. We need active, sharp swords. And so I hope and I pray that you will be able to optimize the word of truth here so that no longer we'll be deceived by twisted truths of the enemy, no longer we'll be distracted by our own truths, but we will know what the word of God says. Amen. If you would like to know more, please visit us at www.thedestinychurch.co.uk